Welcome everyone to the last lecture of this um, spring semester. And it is spring. Just look at the flowers on that cookie table. Wow. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, I want you um, to remind you to turn off your cell phones and also to remind you to look for your next brochure in the mail in August. The next lecture starts the second Friday of September. That's our um, fall semester. So thank you all for being such great um, participants. Um, I know people like coming here to talk to adults. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, there are some feedback forms on some of the uh, chairs. It, we really appreciate um, knowing how you feel about the different lectures. It helps the program committee plan for the next semester, though I suspect they're pretty well planned. Um, now Carol will introduce our speaker. Oh, no. <laughs> Michael will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Scott McLaughlin. He's originally from Jericho, Vermont. And ever since he was back in high school, he's carried out research on Vermont's archaeology and history, often with the UVM Consulting Archaeology Program and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Scott has worked as a museum professional and as an educator since 2005. He's currently the director of the Vermont Granite Museum in Barrie. And there are some brochures that Scott has brought on the table back there, so please do pick them up for more information about the Vermont Granite Museum. Scott also directs Vermont Project Archaeology, which is a professional development program for Vermont teachers. The title of Scott's talk for our closing Triple E lecture of this semester is The Chase, Lake Champlain's Rum Runners and Boat Patrol. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker, Scott McLaughlin. topic that I was introduced to, gosh, when I was an undergrad at the University of Vermont, I got to meet with Merritt Carpenter. Uh, he was a steamboat operator uh, on Lake Champlain uh, at the end of the steamboat era, and then operated uh, vessels for the Lake Champlain Transportation Company. How's that? Better? So Merritt actually lived through this era. <laughs> uh, and he was able to share all kinds of personal stories um, that were handed down to him from the people that he operated boats with on Lake Champlain. Uh, he fell in love with the lake as a young man, and he shared that joy with so many others. Uh, helped to actually establish the Champlain Maritime Society, and then later on the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Uh, he was a, just a fabulous guy to just sit and listen to. Uh, and as I started uh, working on my career, uh, I realized that the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, there are just so many stories to just gather up and share. Uh, and when I started teaching at UVM, uh, one of the first classes I wanted to develop was the history of Lake Champlain. And I knew I had to take and do some additional research from the oral histories to see what else was out there. And when I first developed this presentation in 2005, didn't have a lot of flesh to it because it was difficult to find the information through the newspapers. Uh, there weren't many people left to share the oral histories with. And as time progressed, uh, things became available on the internet. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, go to the Library of Congress's website called Chronicling America. It contains many of our historic newspapers, not just from the state of Vermont, from throughout the United States. And so you can just pick a date, any date between uh, 1800 and about 1926, uh, pick the date, the locations, uh, and very likely you can find that very paper for that day and you can read it. Uh, and so my presentation is every year gets better and better and better <laughs> as things become available. 
another resource that's out there that's just amazing uh, is uh, the Secretary of State's office has decided that the State Archivist should make available as many of our public records as possible. And so if you start at the State Archivist website, uh, you can take and create an account that will gain access to the material that the Mormons have made available on their website. You'd have to pay for it uh, if you lived outside of the state of Vermont because our state has made an agreement with the Mormons. They can scan material, but they have to make it available to us for free. And so there's just a ton of additional court records and municipal papers that they've copied at the archives, and they're, they're available to us. And again, that stuff has just helped to infuse this presentation and made it better uh, as I keep working on it. As a topic, this is the perfect one for college students, but also I find it a great topic uh, for the general public as well, uh, who can't resist uh, something about booze and people trying to break the law. Uh, and so, uh, you know, prohibition is, is also about those that are trying to uh, enforce the laws themselves. Uh, and so we've, we're going to talk a little bit about today the revenuers, the rum runners, and the booze, uh, and a bit about the transportation. But we have to put this into a context. Lake Champlain has had smuggling going all the way back, almost to the very beginning uh, of the colonial era. Uh, it's been a contested zone between various nations, and the people that live and move within this space, they ultimately exchange goods with one another. It didn't matter who you were in terms of uh, your uh, nationality, your, your religion or background. It was all about economics, uh, providing the services and needs of various families that lived in the region. Where it comes to the attention at the national level is during the U.S. Embargo Acts of 1807. Uh, it's during those embargo acts that all of a sudden national focus is on Lake Champlain. Uh, Jefferson is trying to take and avoid getting the United States, the New Republic, involved in a contest between the two major powers of the world, Great Britain and France, during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, he realizes that trying to exchange with one partner over the other is just going to lead to a mess. So how about stop all trade? Well, that's fine if you live in Maryland, but it doesn't work for someone living in the Champlain Valley, where all trade goes north. Everything goes into uh, the uh, Richelieu River, then into the St. Lawrence, and you're exchanging goods in Montreal, Quebec City, uh, and some of your products are ultimately going to find their way in the European market. And any finished goods, you're going to have to buy it from uh, the communities in the St. Lawrence Valley. Pottery, uh, any iron goods that you need, guns, they're going to have to come from uh, Canada. And it doesn't really work out well. That's why we have Smuggler's Notch. Uh, and Smuggler's Notch comes about because of the War of 1812. Uh, eventually, uh, the United States will be embroiled in the war uh, against Great Britain. Uh, and the United States tries to make an attempt to try to stop this level of smuggling. And the smuggling is going both ways. Uh, you have to exchange that goods that you produce on your homestead in the Champlain Valley uh, for those goods that you desire uh, on the other side of the border. And so there's this constant movement of things, and it's cattle that goes through Smuggler's Notch uh, that's coming from uh, the central Vermont region. And it's all these finished goods and also some places currency that's coming back. The war doesn't actually bring, whoops, doesn't bring it to an end. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the war itself keeps speeding up the level of smuggling that takes place. And there's an attitude, well, it has to be this way. Uh, but as soon as the, the conflict starts taking place over at Plattsburgh and the guns are being heard, the first people are the ones that were smugglers they start picking up their guns and they're going to side not with the British, but they're siding with the Americans. And there's a great example in the town history for Jericho. I remember reading as a high school kid uh, and it just stuck in my head um, that the children that were right there next to Jericho Village at school that day, they were hearing the cannon fire and they were taking sticks and placing them together, uh, counting every single fire that they heard at the Battle of Plattsburgh. Uh, and there were people that were coming from the community in Jericho, picking up their guns and trying to figure out how to get to Plattsburgh. Um, so it's the smuggling route, trading route, which historians call the Northern Waterway, uh, that becomes really a strategic importance during the 19th century. 
Uh, the Canadian border here uh, is not a boundary. Uh, it's just a bit of a nuisance because you've got to go through customs. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, you have trading partners, you have relationships, you have usually uh, even family members uh, that are living there. There's constant exchange of knowledge and resources going back and forth. And it's northbound initially, but in 1823 there's something that happens. The Champlain Canal opens up and immediately that transitions all commerce to the south, but only for 20 years. In 1843, the Chambly Canal is opened up and all of a sudden flow is going the full extent of the northern waterway. A population of uh, roughly about 10,000 people are directly involved in operating commerce along this waterway. And the canal boatmen served as my dissertation research. <clears throat> the smuggling of the 19th century uh, was something that was hard to evade. Uh, you had customs officers that were at the border, and yes, they might stop someone for smuggling, uh, find them, but ultimately there was no way to patrol the entire lake. It's way too long, 120 miles in length, 12 miles at its maximum width, and the amount of shoreline and small little inlets and bays uh, and the 12 navigable rivers just make it impossible to deal with. Uh, so it's a perfect location for smugglers. And when it comes to the alcohol components, there's been a prohibition on it uh, going back to the very early part of the 19th century in some communities. And most of it was just peer pressure uh, within your own communities, uh, where especially you had the Congregational Church was the only church in town, uh, then all it took was the members of the church, uh, the elders, to put enough pressure to stop alcohol consumption, or at least in the public realm. And that was something that they definitely wanted to uh, not see uh, taking place in their communities. Uh, and it's the temperance societies that ultimately take up that baton and kind of push it through to becoming both state legislation and even at the national level when you're talking to the 20th century. Uh, and these optional laws that are created by state legislatures, they ultimately don't really work effectively uh, as the nature of communities are constantly shifting and their, their attitude about alcohol uh, consumption, whether it be at a bar uh, or whether it be in your own home. In terms of Canada, they go through the same situation that we do here in the United States. Um, there are option laws for each of the provinces. There are some communities that remain dry in the 19th century. But what they do is they take it to the national level just one year earlier uh, than we do here in the United States. Uh, and they find that it's a dismal failure. It's impossible to try to take and uh, prevent alcohol consumption or manufacturing with Canada. And so the Canadian government decides, well, let's put it back on the provincial governments. And what's really important about this story is that Quebec decides to go wet. <laughs> they want alcohol to be produced and consumed. Uh, and that makes Lake Champlain uh, just an important resource uh, for smuggling uh, of alcohol. Uh, but there were restrictions that were placed on of the, uh, the purchase of alcohol within Quebec. And much of this has to do with the pressures of the United States government on Canada uh, and the province of Quebec, saying you have got to do something about all of this illicit trade. Uh, my clicker's going faster than I am. Uh, another thing that's happening in the 19th and early 20th century is there's always some level of prohibition when it comes to the military consumption of alcohol. I mean, grog was something. That watered down alcohol has been always served to the military uh, on hot days and you know, just give the guys a little bit of a boost uh, in order to get them through uh, the hard labor that they're con involved in. Uh, but in terms of uh, the basis that we have here in the uh, early part of the 20th century, you've got one in uh, Colchester, 40th and Allen, and then you also have Plattsburgh. Both of them had military police. And they prevented uh, the open consumption of alcohol on base. And they certainly didn't like to see guys coming back from you know, going into the city and coming back drunk. Uh, and so there was a lot of uh, pressure upon them to remain dry at least a portion of their week. In terms of consumption in the household, it's a common thing throughout the 19th century. All you need to do is look at any of the uh, records of farms within the region. It talks about the consumption of alcohol uh, when doing haying and uh, 
and just trying to get through, again, labor of the day. And then the long winters, how you get through that with a little bit of, uh, of a boost. And in many cases, the farms are growing apples, uh, and they're turning that into hard cider in the fall. Uh, drinking a bit of regular cider until it starts to harden, uh, and then it becomes the alcohol they consume throughout the winter. And it's a great way to preserve uh, the alcohol, and as we all know, vitamin C is important. Uh, no one wants scurvy, so that's one way to consume that. Uh, and the other thing that's happening is, as different ethnic groups are coming into the state of Vermont, besides just the uh, traditional United Kingdom uh, uh, heritage, and you start seeing others from throughout Europe. They bring with them their technologies of how to produce alcohol of different types, maybe different types of wine, uh, and that's also being produced in the home as well. And the federal government recognized fairly early on after prohibition is instituted uh, that they can't stop this level of production, and most of the enforcement uh, it falls upon uh, your local constables. And they don't want to take and put the constable in a situation where they've got to take and uh, you know, put pressure on their neighbors and their family members and friends. So they allow the consumption or production and consumption of 200 gallons per household, which is a lot, <laughs> at least from my perspective. Uh, and so. And, you can, and then they had issues with, well, who do I share it with? Can I share it with friends? Can I give it as a gift if I'm not selling it? Uh, and there's all sorts of crazy legal cases trying to figure out uh, how to deal with that throughout the, uh, uh, the early part of Prohibition. Prohibition itself, uh, it passes uh, in 1919 and then is instituted in January of 1920. Uh, and it comes with a fairly stiff uh, penalty. Uh, I translated these into $2,018 because we don't have yet the figures for 2019. Um, but your first fine, $12,500. Well, I'd have a hard press time writing a check for that. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't like six months in prison. And then your second offense, and that jumps considerably, $25,000. Now, I'm sorry, I'll have to have got a bank uh, to write you a check. Uh, and five years in prison. And this prison is not one that's local. This is a federal prison. Uh, so you're being sent away from your family and community. Uh, and your neighbor in your cell it might be a murderer, uh, not someone who's simply smuggling a bit of alcohol. And it's quite clear from the Burlington Free Press article of September 16th, 1920, the persistent wetness up and down the lake is a condition by no means due to the water. Uh, as soon as prohibition is enacted in January of 1920, Alcohol is being run on the lake, not on the open waters, because they're frozen. They're being run on these. And if you haven't seen an ice boat in motion, uh, take a look. There are races out on the lake, uh, usually around uh, the Hero Islands. Uh, and it's amazing how fast these boats can go. And they're small. Uh, most of them are less than 20 feet in length. Uh, these boats were carrying uh, 10 cases of alcohol, 55 feet in length. And there's one at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. It's impressive, and these boats are hitting. Uh, the top speeds were recorded in the Hudson Valley during the early 20th century of over 100 miles an hour. Uh, so if it is smooth ice, and you've got nice broad reach, and you've got wind pushing your sails, and they don't have just a single uh, sheet, they've got multiple sheets, including spinnakers that will put on this, just like a regular sailboat, they can cruise. Um, and they're, they're crossing the lake, essentially. Going from St. Jean, uh, Quebec, um, they're coming to Burlington, they're going to Plattsburgh. There's no one at this point policing uh, the traffic that's taking place. But by the end of the summer of 1920, it's quite clear that uh, there's a struggle uh, going on between competition uh, of alcohol crossing the Canadian border and that coming from the east and south. Uh, the alcohol that's coming from the east and south is coming by large vessels, mostly old sailing craft, uh, and they're coming from the Caribbean. They're bringing in not just you know, a few hundred caseloads, they're bringing in 10,000, 15,000 caseloads uh, at a time. They're bringing in barrels of alcohol, uh, and that's just not something that our folks can compete with. So uh, it's quite clear that they need to make a switch in terms of what they're going to bring, and although this is titled Rum Runners, in fact, whoops, uh, the thing that they bring in most frequently is in fact beer. And if you, these are postcards on the far right uh, that uh, are being sent to folks all throughout the Northeast. 
encouraging people to come to Quebec, because this is where you have the fun. <laughs> and so uh, it's beer that um, becomes king for the region. And from the estimates looking at the newspapers, about 75% of what's being transported, that's being caught at least, that I can tell, uh, is beer. And then 25% is various types of uh, hard liquors and uh, high quality wines. Um, so. And when we look at the, the labels, because sometimes in the newspapers it tells me what kind of beer it's coming across, these are the four that pop out as being the top sellers. Uh, and today, Molson owns Black Horse Ale and Carlings, and then Labatt's is independent. So, I mean, these guys, they skyrocketed from moderate um, business companies uh, producing uh, beer to then becoming kings uh, of um, the beer industry of Canada. And just like our tractor trailers that drive on the highways today, um, they try to carry a cargo both ways on their transportation routes. And so did also the smugglers. The smugglers are taking things into Canada uh, that is of desire to them. And uh, the list is fairly short. Uh, the one that surprised me was silk uh, as being one. Uh, Nicardix, uh, cigarettes and cigars, and it made sense. And then the other one that puzzled me for a while is the industrial alcohol. You could produce it, and it was produced in large quantities in New York State. Uh, you could transport it uh, into Canada, get around the, the, uh, the Canadian uh, tariffs and uh, smuggling it in, and then the beer companies would produce, or other alcohol companies would produce from that industrial alcohol a something that we could actually consume. Because industrial alcohol will kill us. And just a small glass, is, you'd be done. Um, in terms of the smugglers, when you look at the records, they're all young guys. Uh, you know, this is a great picture of you know, three of the smugglers. Uh, most of them are veterans of World War I. They're looking for something that gets that excitement that they once had during war. Now, they've just come home from war just a few years before, and they want that same sort of adrenaline rush that they once had. In many cases, they're going through what we know as PTSD, and so they're struggling to try to reunify with you know, connections with their community, with their family and friends, but they can connect with others that have been in war with them. Uh, and um, they're struggling to try to figure out how to make a living. They you know, maybe don't think that the career path that they have been uh, kind of selected by their parents or they had chosen before they'd gone to war is working for them. And they see the opportunity to make a great deal of money quickly. Uh, and you know, some of the people that are coming here, and they're in fact, uh, vacationers. Um, they are people that are coming from the major cities, Boston, Albany, New York, Philadelphia. And they're coming to the Champlain Valley because it's way too hot in the city to spend the summer. This is an era when they don't have air conditioning. Uh, and so instead of sitting there sweating, uh, why don't you come to the Champlain Valley and vacation? So if we look at places like Basin Harbor Club and others, uh, this is the peak of <laughs> them. They just rise in terms of the number of attendees that come in many cases because they have a few fits underneath the bar. Uh, they're not serving just milk and water. Uh, and then there's the ones that are professionals, smugglers that are vacationing in the Champlain Valley um, that have spent much of the remaining part of the year working in New Jersey and New York, uh, creating their network, working with uh, sophisticated apparatus. And here they can just get away from it. They don't have to worry about they having the eye of uh, the federal government on them, constantly looking over the shoulder to see if someone's spying on them. Here they can just relax. Well, in the newspapers, it mentions uh, Rochester Point uh, as being a smuggler's den. But looking at all of the lake charts that we have uh, available to us today, I can't find Rochester Point anywhere. Uh, it doesn't seem to exist physically as a single place, uh, but what I have a feeling is it's actually moving. It's one of those locations, it's a nice vacation home uh, that's set up by the professional smugglers. They invite all their family and friends to come and visit them. Uh, they invite all their partners as part of the smuggling ring, uh, and they set up for the entire summer almost, uh, and they bring in the best alcohol, best food, best chefs, uh, as well as the best prostitutes of Montreal. <laughs> 
Most of the smugglers, though, uh, are not uh, professionals. They're young men that uh, you know, have enough knowledge about Lake Champlain and boating uh, to be able to realize that this is a possibility for them. And a good example is Charles Muskrat Robert, uh, who um, probably found himself struggling financially, uh, and uh, he took the opportunity to make a little extra money. He started creating a network amongst friends and relatives uh, on the New York side, uh, around Plattsburgh, Shazy, Rouse's Point area, uh, and uh, but he never was really very lucky. <laughs> Everything he tried, he tended to fail at, uh, and in this case, he got his nickname because one night he was being chased, uh, and he realized that there was uh, probably no way in which he was going to take an escape successfully, and at that point, he ran his boat aground, and he simply jumped over the side and swam for shore. And from that point on, everybody that knew him called him Muskrat. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, uh, his story doesn't end well. He does get caught. He gets thrown into prison. He spends uh, over five years in prison. He comes back, uh, and he eventually uh, uh, commits suicide. In terms of the allure, there's a lot uh, for young men. However, uh, for someone who has responsibilities, a family, a business, uh, the risk is too great in many cases. And so uh, the idea of fast money, easy work, you don't have to do a great deal, and you can make a tremendous amount of money even in one trip. Uh, so simply going across the border, picking up a case, uh, and then making it simply to, into the Champlain Valley, not very far into it, uh, you can easily multiply your profits by three, four, five uh, times uh, your investment. But you've got to have some capital to buy the alcohol to begin with. You don't get it on credit. Uh, in many cases, they go to places like the Bucket of Blood, which is a bar uh, just across the border in St. Jean. Um, and the idea of being able to make, I would like to make that much money. Uh, um, so having the possibility of making a salary that we today would think would be extravagant, uh, and literally one year of investment of time, uh, is something that most of these young guys cannot uh, stay away from. In terms of another thing that's pushing them uh, into smuggling is the depression. And I can tell you from the records that I've looked at for the granite industry over the last few years, for the granite industry, the depression begins in 1921. Uh, and there's a slump and it starts to decline. Then I started looking at, well, how about upland farms? How many of them are being abandoned in the 1920s? Uh, even greater than there was in the 1880s. Uh, and again, so those young farmhands, they got to find something to do. You look at the manufacturing that's taking place uh, and the mills here in Winooski and Burlington area, um, they're not doing great. Uh, there's a lot of competition that's taking place for all these manufacturers outside of the region. And so, as the joke goes, uh, found in many, many histories about the Depression era in Vermont, everybody in Vermont went, what depression? It was like every day. <laughs> it didn't really change things for us in the state. There was already a, a crunch when it came to um, your margin of success uh, as companies or businesses of any kind, farmers, whatever it be. But it certainly in 1929 things started to decline, maybe at a little bit more faster rate. Uh, and so these kids were really trying to find something that was new for them. The dangers, they certainly were there. Uh, uh, just looking through the newspapers, you can find many, many cases of vessels running aground. They're not traveling often during the middle of the day when they can see the obstructions on Lake Champlain. Uh, instead, they're traveling in the middle of the night with absolutely no running lights on to try to evade uh, anyone's notice. Uh, and uh, the lake charts that were available in the 1920s and 30s, they weren't all that accurate. They were designed for steamboat captains. They were designed for tugboatmen that were towing canal boats. Uh, and they were staying in the main channel. Um, these guys are running close to shore, zipping in and out of harbors, uh, trying to evade other vessels. And so they're cutting it really, really tight uh, and often finding themselves stuck aground. And in terms of uh, some other things, your vessel sinking is very likely the case when you're talking about boats that are made out of wood, if they're not well maintained, uh, they're not commercial craft where you're working the boat every day, 
Uh, you understand what its problems are. These kids are getting on the boat, and they're running a few runs a year, or a week, and over the year, they're not really paying much attention to maintenance. Uh, they're not commercial operators, uh, like the canal boatmen and others. So leaky boats is really very likely, and the other thing is they're overloading them well beyond their capacity. There's not weather reporting. Uh, there's no forecasting available to them in the 1920s and 30s, and so the possibility of an, a storm coming up rapidly is very, very likely. Uh, and knowing from what we saw with our lake survey that the Maritime Museum did, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of small little watercraft sunk on the lake. We only really looked at the boats that are in 12 feet of water or deeper. And as we inspected uh, the boats, we saw a lot of them just sitting in the bottom uh, from our side scan sonar. We didn't go down and verify them. It's unknown whether or not they're from run runners or if they're just pleasure craft that sank, but I'm sure many of them are probably attributed uh, to uh, this era. And in terms of engines, these are engines of the 1920s and 30s. They're not the modern watercraft of today. They're not something that's really all that seaworthy compared to uh, modern boats. And if you've got a boat that's overloaded, uh, running at f almost full speed, uh, the possibility of falling overboard is great. And these kids are not wearing their life jackets, I can guarantee you that. Uh, and the other thing that might happen is there are people on shore that realize that there's a possibility that they can get you to dump your, your cargo uh, if they fear that they're going to ca get caught. And so there's people on shore from the newspapers that talks about them shooting guns into the air <laughs> as they hear a motorboat go by in the middle of the night with no lights. <laughs> and their hope is that the next morning they wake up and there's some bottles floating around. <laughs> there's also... Uh, the smugglers are shooting at one another in order to get uh, their alcohol. If you are caught, you've obviously uh, going to be, uh, all, all the alcohol is confiscated, your boat's confiscated, any property on board it, it is now property of the federal government. Uh, and then the other thing is you're gonna get fined, you're gonna get thrown in prison, and this is the pretty prison that you might go to. This one's built in Atlanta, Georgia, specifically for hardened criminals and those um, that uh, were smuggling alcohol during the era. Uh, not the, quite the vacation home that they all uh, liked. Uh, and here they are on Rouse's Point, smashing all the bottles in the waterfront. And here is the sale that's taking place of all of the confiscated goods, as well as boats, uh, over at Rouse's Point uh, at the customs office station. And so as boats are confiscated, uh, they are often then sold, and guess who buys them? Smugglers. <laughs> The idea of fines and uh, prison time wasn't really significant enough for many of these young men to resist uh, smuggling. And so uh, the US government decides, we're going to up the ante. And so with the Jones Act of 1929, uh, they increased the fines significantly and also the jail time. And now it's getting scary. And so a lot of these young kids decide to back away and say, OK, this is not really for me anymore. Uh, I didn't make the money that I expected to make. Um, the risk is too great. But for a lot of them, uh, they were buying new boats, new cars. And I'm talking about the best boats and best cars you could imagine during the 1920s and 30s. Uh, and they're buying homes for their parents. Uh, they're taking care of their grandmother. Uh, and it's working for them. But it's a select few. A lot of them are trying to figure out new techniques by which to smuggle the goods across uh, into the United States. Uh, and they do everything from taking out the day sailor, beautiful boat over there on the right, uh, bringing girlfriends along, uh, and then making it look like a leisurely excursion across Missisquoi Bay to Phillipsburg, pick up a few cases, stick it in the hold, uh, cover it up, and then try to sail back towards Maquam Bay. Uh, and for some, it works, uh, and for others, it doesn't. Uh, even um, small rowboats, again, make it a nice leisurely row from Rouse's Point across to St. John and then row back. And the lake is not a boundary. It's a very fluid population constantly moving uh, on the lake. There are a lot more boats in the past than there are at present on Lake Champlain. The canal boats are a constant movement on the lake. This is a canal boat tow behind. There's the tug. Uh, this is a Canadian pin flat. 
Uh, but these are all American watercraft, most likely all home ported right here in the Champlain Valley. They're carrying cargoes from as far away as Ottawa uh, at the north end of their route, all the way to New York or Philadelphia to the south. And aboard those vessels, uh, there'd be cargo as well. Uh, that would be both legal and illicit in many cases. And in terms of the boats, just to give an idea, uh, this is the beautiful Chris craft. This is an advertisement uh, for the era, and every single one of them talks about speed, 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 speed. Uh, and it's impressive. Uh, there are motorboats out Lake Champlain right now that have 1,000 horsepower, uh, and they were out there on Lake Champlain almost 100 years ago as well. Uh, and they're the ones you hear running down the lake in the middle of the summer. Uh, and um, these are modern watercraft. Uh, and they're impressive, and these boats were trying to push those limits as well. And look at the manufacturers, uh, Chris Craft, Chrysler, uh, Gray, these are the boats of the era, and they're the beautiful ones with teak. Um, these are the boats that they're buying, uh, bringing into the Champlain Valley, uh, and uh, this is a good example of one. This was a sea sled, brand new boat, uh, 450 horsepower, maximum speed of 58 miles per hour, uh, cruising on Lake Champlain, completely loaded in alcohol, 93 cases uh, caught uh, and seized at Shazy Landing. Uh, and uh, these are kids. These are not uh, wealthy community members. These are kids that somehow could afford a boat of this uh, price tag and also buy that quantity of alcohol north. Many of those boats, like the sea sled, get turned into this. They've stripped it bare. It is simply a shell uh, and a massive motor. Uh, and this is required if you want to maximize your cargo load. This is not a pleasure craft to be run around during the middle of the day. This is a boat that you're using in order to transport alcohol. And so during the day, this boat disappears someplace and gets covered up, uh, maybe in a boathouse. And at night, it cruises across uh, the border. And so. Now, to put 400 cases on this is not that long. That means you're piling it as high as you possibly can, creating a very unstable watercraft. In terms of your destinations, you go to the communities that are either have high populations, like Plattsburgh or uh, to Burlington, uh, or you go to communities that have uh, these nice little camps that are being set up along the lake shore for tourism. And so that would be Virgins, uh, Essex, uh, you still have uh, some of these uh, clubs that still exist today, like the uh, one at Basin Harbor. Uh, and I mean, you're going to take your product in, and you've already got a ready sale. Uh, you're guaranteed. There are tourists that are there. You've got the, uh, the uh, folks that own uh, the camps. They're going to be buying it for their own bar and you set up a, essentially a regular route, just like the milkman, <laughs> bringing in alcohol every single week, and it's pretty much guaranteed. In terms of uh, the destination, it's also dictated based upon what you're traveling in. If you're going by rowboat, you're not going very far. You're gonna probably just cross the border and try to get it either on a dock or into a building right along the lake shore. If you're doing canal boats, you're not dropping off any cargo in the Champlain Valley. Everything is going to New York. So you're going to take care of the speakeasies in New York City. And there are 30,000 of them estimated to be in New York City during this era. So there is no lack of business in New York. Uh, so you know, it just can't compare with the few cities and the very low population we have in our region. These are the young guys that are uh, taking care of uh, our local needs. The canal boatmen. Uh, they consist often of nuclear families on these vessels, uh, and uh, it's a big risk for them, uh, but there's also a big return. <laughs> and as I mentioned, they get uh, more inventive in terms of how they transport the alcohol. Uh, and this was a great one uh, that I found in the newspapers. So this is a, just a picture of a log, but you can imagine this log being hollowed out, filled up with bottles, not many, maybe 10, and then you just pull this behind your rowboat, your day sailor, uh, and you know, cast your line, do a little fishing at the same time, and, you know, and then in the evening, after you're done, uh, you're in port and taking care of your boat, and as it gets dark, then you go out and you just pull that log in. Um, the other thing was, 
I thought this was ingenious. Taking a boat, uh, fairly small barge, uh, and then loading it up, uh, and then actually letting it sink. Uh, but not completely, but just enough so it's below the water line and then dragging it behind another boat. So you can take a lot more than that log. <laughs> this was one that uh, I found, taking the bottom of a rowboat uh, and creating a false bottom to it so you can load it up with bottles. Again, you're not transporting a lot. And here's one. So beautiful Chris Craft probably boat here. Uh, they stripped it of all of its teak, its deck, everything's gone. And notice that these platforms on the side. And what you would do is you take your cases and you'd load them up onto these boards. Uh, and if you thought that you were going to get caught, then all you simply do is you tip them overboard. But before you do that, you make sure that they're tied to a block of salt. Because the weight of the bottles, which are filled, there's not much flotation. They're going to sink, taking that salt block with them. The salt then melts over several hours, and then <laughs> it pulls it back up. It has just enough flotation so it can get to the surface. And if you need to have real clear indication as to where it is, then you attach a small float to it. And so you dump them overboard. You come back and maybe and it was between 8 and 12 hours later, and here you go. All these little tiny floats on the water surface, and you just pick them up. Uh, and it doesn't take very long for those on shore to realize this is what's happening in the night. And so that's why you shoot your gun in the air, and hopefully by morning, you'll see some floats. Um, in terms of my canal boat, as I say, there's quite, quite a great risk involved because um, these canal boatmen, um, they couldn't afford by 1918, after the opening of the Champlain Barge Canal, which is big, 300 feet in length, uh, it's uh, 100 feet wide, so it's just massive. You can't operate these smaller watercraft efficiently, uh, and they couldn't afford the bigger boats. So instead, you operate two of them. So these two might be operated by a single family. You live in the cabin uh, of one, the other might be a workroom. Uh, uh, in the cabin, or it might be a, a deckhand that you've hired uh, because you're a little busy uh, that particular season. And you're loaded up with cargo. The, these boats are uh, 100 feet long, uh, 17 and a half feet wide, and stand about 10 feet tall. Uh, the cabin itself is you know, like 16 and a half by 14. Um, they have a deck in the cabin that's three feet off the bottom. And for many, uh, of the canal boatmen, what they would do is they would hide uh, within the center of their cargo cases of alcohol. And you notice the customs officers over here? They've got these steel rods. And so they're hoping that they'd stick it in that hay and all of a sudden smash, and out would come uh, some sort of liquid. Uh, take a taste, oh yeah, uh, good stuff. Uh, and so in the confiscation, you lose both your boats, you lose all of your property, Dad goes to jail, and the kids are destitute with their mom. Uh, they do not have a home. They're home ported in the Champlain Valley, and in many cases I find from the records uh, and the oral histories that I collected that most of these families, um, they end up uh, going to live with their uh, you know, maybe parents or other relatives, and in some cases the kids even have to get split up uh, to live with relatives further afield. Uh, and so it's a huge blow uh, to these families. <clears throat> and in collecting the oral histories, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, several in family members. And one recording and uh, written document that I found was for Eva Mae Wilkins. And she remembers as a young child, probably around the ages of four or five years old. Uh, she couldn't quite remember what year it was. But she remembered every time they went through Rouse's Point and had to stop at the customs station, uh, the customs officer would come down in the cabin and do his search, pull out all the drawers, look under the beds, and her mother and father would say, get on the potty, get on the potty. And so they'd pull out the little metal basin, she'd sit it right in the middle of the room, her mother would, and she'd have to flip up her dress and sit down on the potty. Customs officer would come down, and she would sit there and spin, watching the customs officer go around the entire cabin, poking into everything, and then after he'd leave, OK, it's all right. You can get up now. And she kept asking her parents, why do I? I don't have to go potty. It's like, sit on the potty. Uh, well, in the middle of the cabin, um, there was an area rug, great big one. Uh, and then under that rug, there was a hatch. Pick that up. And remember, there's three feet of deck between the, the bottom of the hold and the deck of the cabin. 
that would be filled with alcohol. <laughs> and so Eva Mae Wilkins didn't realize that until she got into high school. Um, but uh, it was one of the ways her family could make a little extra money. It was pretty tight going uh, after the opening of the Champlain Barge Canal. Uh, there were large barges being constructed by big major uh, shipping companies. They're steel. They don't have to have anyone on board. And the types of cargoes they were carrying uh, were ones that were just bulk cargoes. There wasn't a great deal of profit to be made by anyone transporting things like hay from Canada to New York to feed all the horses. Uh, it just There wasn't much there to be had. In terms of the law enforcement side, the revenue side uh, of this story, uh, well, traditionally in the region, uh, we have local constables. And their job was to deal with arguments between neighbors and you know, some unrowdy people that had come from outside of town. Uh, get them out. Uh, and at the federal level, you had the customs officers at the border. You also had a border patrol. So you know, customs officers deal with shipment of legal goods back and forth. Border Patrol is dealing with people going back and forth. Uh, and at this point, you have the Chinese Exclusion Acts and things like that. And so the idea of keeping those people out was important to the federal government. Uh, and it wouldn't be until much later uh, into the 20s um, that they would actually institute a prohibition agents and then also a marine and boat patrol on Lake Champlain. And at the state level, the state of Vermont didn't have a state police. I wouldn't come till decades later. New York State had a really new state police force. Uh, and you have your county sheriffs. They're dealing with uh, criminals, uh, courts. Uh, they're not dealing a lot with individuals that they encounter every day. Uh, they're not traveling very far. It's these people that are often noticing what's happening in their community. And they didn't <clears throat> want to share all that information with federal agents. and. They were dealing with their own issues the way they wanted to. So it's really hard to deal with enforcement. New York State decided that uh, they needed to create a parallel law to the federal law. Because uh, as we know, state police are not there to uh, fulfill the federal obligations of their laws. We're, they're there to uh, fulfill the obligation of state laws. And so New York uh, created the Volstead Act. Uh, and it didn't last very long, 26 months, and it was done. And the reason why is because there's no way to patrol uh, a border that runs all the way across New York State. At 445 miles, there wasn't enough people to man that, and the resources that were available were vehicles like this. They don't do too well uh, on hard, rough roads, uh, and they had no money to put into uh, trying to uh, deal with this new law. In terms of the Canadian government, uh, they'd already abandoned uh, their prohibition laws, and they didn't really negotiate well with the US federal government. But the federal government here would constantly put pressure on them right from the beginning of 1920 on. And in many cases, the Canadian government, um, they wouldn't even inform folks that, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, we saw cases of alcohol on board, but <laughs> we're just going to let it go through. Uh, but eventually, in 1924, they decided to create this exchange of information. Uh, at, but the problem was that it didn't state that it had to be today. <laughs> what about three days from now? And so there was a lot of delay in that information, and that didn't uh, set very well with the prohibition agents on this side of the border. Uh, and it wouldn't be until 1930 that uh, the Canadian government said, OK, all right, fine. We'll stop the alcohol when we see it on board vessels or cars, or anybody transporting across the border. Um, but you've got to remember, in terms of the agents, their position, all right, inside Rouse's Point, well distant from the actual border itself, unlike today's border stations, which are right there on the border, these are in town. And the one on the Vermont side is in St. Albans. You've got Highgate Swan <laughs> to go through before you even get there. Uh, and so people simply avoided this. But this is in an era, these stations were created in an era where um, the citizenry just followed the laws, right? It was an expectation that you would do so, and you did. Uh, it was the peer pressure of not following the law. Uh, and when you get to the 1920s, people are beginning to question federal laws and state laws. Are these really legitimate? Are these really valuable? 
uh, as a way to control our population. Uh, some people saw as, no, I don't believe in this. And so if I don't believe in it, I don't need to follow it. In terms of Lake Champlain, it was open waters uh, for the first few years. And it meant the traffic was just immense uh, of alcohol flowing across the border. Uh, there were some people that were caught, but without a marine boat patrol, uh, it meant that if you had a fast enough boat uh, and you could get the stuff loaded quickly enough, you could cruise right through with no problem. Uh, and eventually there would be a recognition that, uh, by the federal government, that they needed to create some sort of system by which to stop uh, this illicit trade. And so they created Lake Champlain Boat Patrol. Uh, and here are our officers. <laughs> Remember how big Lake Champlain is? <laughs> this is it. <laughs> 16 of them in total, actually, uh, was the max. Uh, and it was organized by uh, John Jack Kenrick. Um, like so many veterans that came out of World War I, uh, they were given opportunities to have federal positions. And so often they worked for the Customs Department, uh, the Border Patrol, uh, or they worked for the US Postal Service. Uh, and that was their reward for uh, going to war. Uh, but many of them saw it as the most boring job ever, and they wanted out. And so that was certainly true for Jack. He wanted off the border. Uh, I believe he was in Derby. Uh, he just couldn't stand it any longer. And so when there was an opportunity uh, to do the boat patrol, he took it. Uh, and when hired, they recognized his leadership skills and said, okay, we're gonna put you in command of this. Uh, and you need to create a team. And from his military experience, he realized he needed to have a heavyweight, a muscle man, in order to take and deal with any of the unrowdy smugglers. And so he went after uh, a former uh, amateur boxer, uh, Midget Levine. And so Midget would be his muscle man. He'd take care of anybody, uh, pound him into submission. And then he realized he needed uh, guys that he could trust. And he turned to UVM students. Uh, and uh, those UVM students really were a great pool for him because he realized that these were kids that had a career path, a choice that they wanted uh, to make. Uh, and if they screwed up, not only would, might they end up in prison uh, and, uh, and fined, but that career path would be closed to them uh, forevermore. Uh, and so it made sense to go after UVM students to assist them. And in terms of his setup, he went to his mom. <laughs> like we all do, go to our parents uh, when we're young. Uh, and so he went to his mom and he asked her if it was okay to set up at her camp uh, in Colchester uh, and for a while used actually her boat. <laughs> uh, it, it worked all right, um, but the problem was that uh, Mallets Bay is so far in. Although there were uh, the Mallets Bay camps there, there was a lot of alcohol flowing in and you could have, so Broadway mus musicals during the summer they were actually tested in Vermont, in many cases, during this era. Um, snips, bis pieces of those performances would be done here. You'd also have some of the best jazz musicians. They got out of the city. They came to Vermont, they came to the Champlain Valley, uh, they'd perform, and so it was a pretty good location for a while, but once everybody knew he was there, they were, no, I'm not gonna, not gonna even attempt to try to bring it in. Uh, then he decided the best place to be was here right at the crossing for the swing bridge uh, for the railroad, um, crossing between uh, Rouse's Point and Alberg. Now this is the main channel. Most of the vessels are coming from uh, the St. Jean's region of Quebec. Uh, there were some coming through Missisquoi Bay, but most of it was coming from the Montreal area, area uh, either by rail or by car, truck, uh, or by boat uh, towards the Champlain Valley. So this is where he thought he could stop most of that traffic. Uh, and it made sense to plunk yourself right there inside that very building uh, where the keeper of the bridge was located. That bridge could be operated all night long. And so a keeper had to be present 24-7. Uh, and the way they communicated with boatmen was through light signals. Whoops. Uh, in terms of what he could do, he could only really search He could only really search boats um, that uh, were on the water. Uh, he couldn't search anything on land. And so that made it really difficult for him to try to take and uh, 
uh, stem some of the alcohol traffic. Because as soon as they got to land, they toss those cases overboard, stick it in a building, and then you have to go after a warrant. So it was really important to make sure you stop them on the water. So they got in that building, which often the case was uh, something the farmer actually put right on the edge of their property. Uh, you know, he was kind of stuck. Uh, and all they'd have to do is just pick up the building and move it someplace else. In terms of most of the seizures, they were small. Uh, and in many cases, they were too small for him or others to take and deal with, even for those uh, that were uh, patrolling the border region uh, on land. Uh, if it was a bottle or two, just they'd seize the bottles and send you on. And so they kind of did the same type of thing on Lake Champlain as well. So give you a slap on the hand. In terms of uh, the uh, examples that I could find through the newspapers, this is probably one of the most heartbreaking ones um, that dealt with a canal boat. Uh, 2,000 barrels, not even bottles, uh, completely loaded, filled with alcohol. Uh, and the entire family uh, was thrown into jail, actually, initially. And then the, the mother and children were sent off. Uh, and stuck on a train uh, off to their, her parents. Uh, and this gentleman uh, lost everything, his entire family, essentially. So, and one of the things, you saw the picture of the guy breaking the bottles in the uh, shoreline at Rouse's Point. One of the concerns was they were to dump all this alcohol from these canal boats into Lake Champlain. What's that mean if I eat the fish? <laughs> I'm consuming alcohol? Could I be arrested? Uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of bottles broken on the Rouse's Point waterfront. Uh, and today it's covered up by uh, part of the park. Uh, and so an archeologist, you know, several centuries from now is gonna just find one solid mass of bottles. Uh, in terms of the boat patrol craft, uh, here you've got, uh, so this boat is this one. That's the vessel. That's Old Pops. This is what it looked like initially. Uh, beautiful craft, and then completely stripped. And so here are our boat patrolmen in their dress uniforms. Uh, this was a summer opportunity for many of them, uh, and uh, greatly enjoyed by those on the Burlington waterfront when they came into the, uh, to the area, or, or to St. Albans. So. In terms of the network that was developing throughout uh, the age of prohibition, uh, uh, it involved individuals that were all throughout the entire region, uh, both on the Vermont and New York side. Uh, and uh, the smugglers themselves, um, they created ways in which to communicate back and forth uh, across the lake, uh, understanding where the need was for uh, quantities of alcohol, where were the tourists all coming in that particular year, uh, and you know, the seizures are pretty big, uh, considering it's just like Champlain. But probably the one of the most interesting ones, which needs to be uh, delved into in more detail, uh, is one that took place with a, uh, a professional smuggler named Snyder. Uh, and Snyder, uh, he worked out of New Jersey, uh, and the federal government was trying to catch him. Um, but he was uh, a leader of many, many henchmen uh, and uh, a great big large network within the metro area of New York. And there was no way to touch him because he always isolated himself. But when he came to the Champlain Valley, what he did is he left himself vulnerable. He tended to do things himself. Mm, not a good idea. <laughs> uh, and so Kendrick and his men knew exactly where he lived. He lived on Maquam Bay. They knew what his boat looked like, and it was like this. Massive vessel, amazing amount of horsepower. He took two Liberty motors, uh, which are these World War I airplanes, and put those in the boat. This thing could probably top uh, pretty close to 100 miles an hour, uh, full out. Uh, and he go across the border in order to get alcohol for himself, his friends that came to visit his camp on Maquam Bay uh, in Swanton, and he cut through the islands. Uh, and Kendrick knew uh, every time he came. All he had to do was listen. <laughs> you could hear him. And he'd cruise with no lights on. Uh, and they thought one night maybe they could catch him. They were at the Rouse's Point Bridge. Only well, saw him cross, let him go. He turned around. He zoomed back through. There was no way of possibly catching up to him. His boat was way too fast. 
But as Kendrick followed him that night, uh, he tried to figure out, how is it that I can take and pin him? And it came to him. It's like, he's not running with lights on. I can get him on other violations. They're also federal violations. And so he pulled into the dock at Maquam Bay, went up to Snyder's house, knocked on the door. Uh, Snyder had dumped his alcohol because he thought someone was following him. He didn't have anything on board for alcohol. Uh, uh, Kendrick had no warrant to take and search his home. Uh, but what he did is he put him under arrest. Because before he got up to the door, he wrote down, operating a vessel uh, and hazardous waters with no running lights, uh, running a vessel uh, uh, that could endanger other watercraft. He had no manual, operator's manual, uh, for operating on open waters in the boat. He had no life jackets. He had all these penalties listed up. So he put him in cuffs and dragged him to St. Albans to the, to the courthouse. And they threw him in jail for the night. He was pissed, livid. Uh, and they didn't call the judge. <laughs> So he had to spend the night in prison. The very next day, the judge he did, did what he could. He confiscated the vessel, uh, and he fined him. Uh, and the vessel was then sold over at Ross's, Ross's Point. And my assumption is, who bought it back? Snyder. But he got him. And whether or not uh, he was at all successful at uh, evading uh, federal uh, prosecutors in New Jersey, I don't know. So that's one of the things. I'd like to know more about Snyder. So, In terms of uh, the, uh, the chase that took place on Lake Champlain between uh, the smugglers and the boat patrol, in uh, some cases uh, it was pretty successful, like with Snyder. Uh, and you know, to have to be fined $550 was literally just a slap on the, f not even the hand, the finger, uh, for someone like Snyder, who was probably making somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of million dollars a year from his uh, enterprise. Um, but it was something that uh, was seen as a great success. Uh, in terms of disasters, there were a couple of them uh, that stand out. Uh, there were several near disasters, and this is a good example of one. So remember Midget uh, Levine? Uh, well, Midget was uh, working one night uh, with another officer, Lawrence Izzard, uh, and they heard a boat cruising through underneath uh, the turn bridge uh, at Rouse's Point. And they're like, we just came in to take a rest. How did they know? How is it possible they could know that we just took a rest? And it came to them. Somebody's signaling them. And it might be the operator. So they checked to see what the operator was doing. And so they snuck in, opened the door, and they watched him. Sure enough, he's signaling to all the smugglers. It's Perfect time, come through, come through. Uh, and sure enough, zoom, the boats had come through. So they just devised a plan where they were gonna tie a rope from one piling to the next. And as soon as that boat would come through, the hope was that it would stop the boat. Well, it didn't stop the boat. Uh, but what it did do is it got cut by the prop and it got tangled within the, the prop of the boat. And it just got wrapped around and around and around. And they took off chasing uh, the smugglers. Uh, and at this night, um, the boat slowed down a bit, uh, and uh, uh, Izzard uh, jumped over uh, onto the vessel. And the typical uh, chase involved one of the boat patrolmen actually laying out onto the bow of their boat, and as they got close to the smuggler, they would jump onto the smuggler's watercraft, uh, and they tried to stop the boat, yank out wires, uh, whatever they could possibly do. But in this case, they beat the crap out of Izzard and they chucked him overboard. Uh, it's pitch black. Uh, and Midget was able to take and run around and he wasn't able to pick up uh, uh, Izzard. And it's only because of his life jacket. That's the only thing that saved him. He was floating in the water with his head above uh, and that was the only reason why he was still alive. Later on, they did find the boat completely empty, uh, made it all the way to Virgins, which was its destination. And these boats, for them, they're a dime a dozen. There was one death, though, um, that I was able to find through the newspapers. Uh, and this was another high-speed chase. In this case, it was George Valley uh, and Herbert Pashby. Uh, and uh, it was um, 
Another one, Lawrence Babcock, uh, was the officer that was hanging on the bow that night. Uh, and someplace in the dark, he transferred over and he falls overboard. Uh, and they can't find him on the open water right outside of Burlington Bay. And what's interesting to note is that what happens the very next day in the newspapers, um, or two days later it's recorded, but the next day uh, it mentioned that who was out there searching for his body? Almost every one of the smugglers, the boat patrolmen, and most people had boats around Lake Champlain in the central part of the lake. There was something different about you know, just simply smuggling as opposed to someone getting really seriously hurt and possibly dying. And so that moral compass that these smugglers had was not gone, it still was present. They just saw that the law really didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but when it came to serious injuries, they realized that those guys were doing a job, the boat patrolmen, and they didn't want to see someone harm. Unfortunately, they never did find his body, um, but it was definitely a sorrowful, a, a, a week where sorrow was felt amongst every member within the Champlain Valley. So Lake Champlain really is uh, you know, a place of advantage for the smuggler. Uh, for the small boat patrol uh, that was on Lake Champlain, there was no way they were going to stem the tide of the alcohol or need and desire of the young men or those that wanted the business. Uh, there was uh, a growing attitude that uh, it was just a way of living uh, at that time in the Champlain Valley. Uh, there really wasn't uh, the uh, funds necessary to support the boat patrol so that they had the fastest and best equipment. Uh, it was always the smugglers that would outbeat them with the technology uh, and resources. Uh, and uh, it was always done in the cover of darkness. Uh, and there was no way in which to really understand what was happening on Lake Champlain without things like radar. The technologies that we use today in order to stop smuggling uh, here in the Champlain Valley, it still continues. Uh, it still happens on Lake Champlain to the very present, um, but most of it is stemmed thanks to the Coast Guard that's here 24-7. Uh, in terms of, there was, uh, in the, uh, the community uh, here in the Champlain Valley, there was a great deal of doubt on their part uh, that this law was really effective at doing what it was supposed to do. It tended to tear families apart, communities apart, uh, it tended to lure young men into situations that uh, were kind of a spiral for them in terms of their moral compass. Uh, like Charles Robert, uh, you know, if he'd never got involved in smuggling, his life may have continued and he may have had children, he may have been successful, um, but unfortunately the smuggling just took him into a realm that ultimately he could not get out of. Uh, and so the moral cost uh, to this entire endeavor was one that they could see it eroding away at the moral compass of individuals who, prior to it, would just follow the laws because it was expected of them. But now they began to question things, question the speed limits, question everything about uh, what uh, others were telling them they should and should not do. It was a day of celebration when prohibition came to an end. Uh, and almost the headline of every newspaper uh, throughout the United States uh, is an exclamation uh, about prohibition ending. It's, it's not a, uh, a time of sorrow, it's a time of um, great cheer. Uh, the amount of alcohol consumption all throughout prohibition increases, not decreases. Uh, and uh, again, uh, the illicit trade, not just in alcohol but other things and violations, the development of the mafia and uh, organized crime in the United States, it increases. Uh, and so uh, the state and federal governments begin to realize that, okay, this was a failure, uh, but now we have to deal with all the ramifications of what's happened as a result of this illicit trade and other uh, immoral acts uh, seen by our laws and our communities. Um, and so we increase the numbers of jails, we increase the number of convicts, uh, and it also uh, continues to fuel other types of smuggling operations that take place. <coughs> In terms of this history, it's something that uh, has been investigated, but it's sort of at the surface level, scratches, 
Uh, and two books that are available, no longer in print, but certainly through interlibrary loan, you may even have it uh, in your local library, are these two, very well written. Uh, Alan Everest was a historian over at Pottsburg uh, State, uh, and then uh, Scott Wheeler's book, Rum Runners and Revenuers. Uh, and they concentrate largely on what was happening on land, which was very large and in some cases highly organized. Uh, but they also touch upon what was happening on Lake Champlain as well. And if you find anything uh, that I haven't talked about today, please let me know, because it's still a topic of interest of mine. Uh, it, it is definitely uh, something that uh, is uh, a part of uh, you know, what's happened not only here at the local level, but also at the national level. And, it, and I think a lot can be learned from this experience uh, as we move forward with uh, you know, prohibitions on drugs in, in the United States and uh, other prohibitions as well. What works best? Is it peer pressure or is it actually uh, laws that come from our federal and state government? Um, who knows? So something Thank to be you. investigated. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Are there any questions? All right, well, thank you for coming out today.